Good morning and happy Resurrection Day to everyone. Uh, we're so glad you could join us this morning. We're going to start out with the chorus, Behold the Lamb. Okay. Behold the Lamb, me. Good morning and welcome to Frost Baptist Church. So glad you tuned in to join with us. Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day. And I uh, just want to remind you, uh, this is how we're doing worship here for a few weeks. Uh, continue to pray for those around you. Again, I want to remind you that if you have tithes and offerings to give, you can take them by the bank and give them in or call us here at the church or drop them by. Whatever you need to do, we'll try to help you out with that because we know a lot of people are being inconvenienced and in uh, indisposed at this time so i just uh want to let you know that we're here to help you out remember to check on your neighbors as much as you can call folks and things like that so i uh, want to share a scripture with you this morning as we talk about easter today uh, such a glorious rejoicing that we can have over that when christ was resurrected but i want to remind you what isaiah told us about 700 years before christ was even born this is what isaiah writes in chapter 53 surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shepherd is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him as he put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. And that is exactly what Christ did for us on that Easter 2,000 years ago. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together to rejoice. Father, thank you for those who are listening. Lord, thank you for this reminder. Every year we can do this, Father. Actually, every day we should do it, but we have this specific time set when we truly focus on that, that blessing that you gave us, the cross and an empty grave. And Lord, I pray for those who are watching right now. Lord, we know no one is watching by accident. Father, we know no one just turned on to this, whether it's even right at this moment live or later when they go back to view this. Father, it's because your spirit is touching them. It's because your message is coming out. And Lord, I pray that you continue to watch over us. Thank you, Lord, that you gave your only begotten son who died in our place at the cross of Calvary, rose again, 
to, in order to make us the people of God. It's in your name I pray, Lord. Amen. 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 We're going to sing my story because the story of the crucifixion is my story. That should have been me on that cross. Jesus gave his life willingly, not for anything that he had done, but to pay for our sins. So sing this with us. If I told you my story, you would hear hope that wouldn't let go. If I told
chorus um, now, and as she sings, we're going to have a video that's going to be playing, and I just wanted to warn you, in case you have some little bitties watching, it will depict um, scenes from the crucifixion, and some of them are pretty graphic, and sometimes, even though that's hard to look at, I think we need that slap in the face sometimes, that reminder that um, of exactly what it cost Christ. You know, sometimes we just think, oh, Jesus died on the cross. Well, it was horrible and gruesome and painful, and we should never lose sight of that, that yes, he died, but it wasn't just an easy, quick death, um, and that's just more demonstrating his love for us. So worship with us as we sing this. <clears throat> And our internet's running slow, so it may take a second. I wish I knew an Easter joke or something. <laughs>
studying through the book of Romans, but today we're going to take a story from the Easter story itself from the crucifixion and resurrection. So turn with me, if you can, to Luke chapter 23, and we're going to be looking at verses 32 through 43. So as you turn there, uh, join us as we can. And I hope you guys are actually singing these songs, by the way, when you're at home. Uh, you know, you do it in the shower already, so go ahead and do it in the living room too. And, uh, you know, if there's anybody there, they're used to you, they probably live with you anyhow, just go ahead and sing out in front of them. Uh, this is something glory to God, so don't be afraid of that. So I want you to actually enjoy this time of worship, actually participate in it right there where you are. So uh, I don't sing loud here because then everyone would hear it. And, you know, as much as I wish I could sing, it's not as much as people around me wished I could sing. So, uh, but I promise I do participate here too. But uh, thank you for the Lord that we have these ladies who can lead us in that. And they're definitely gifted and talented with that. Um, <clears throat> All throughout history, you know, needs have always arisen and, and things have come up when people just had to do some things. And then there's some things where people just tried something new in order to push something that they had as an idea. And one of those particular things was a man named Evan Kane. He was a doctor. He lived in uh, to about 1932. But he was amazing. And he was from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he wanted to, to tell people that anesthesia works. And he wanted to be able to, to tell them they didn't have to use a lot of alcohol like they did. And they could actually use local anesthetics instead of putting the whole body to sleep. And to prove his point, he did nothing better than to do surgery on himself three times. The first time was in 1919. He actually amputated one of his own fingers because something had happened to it. And then later, at the age of 60 in 1921, he removed his own appendix just using mirrors and local anesthetics. But of course, it wasn't done then in 1932. At the age of 70, he had to repair a hernia that he'd received from horseback riding. So he actually did this himself. But sometimes we're not just pushing an idea. Sometimes we get into a situation where we need this. One particular doctor was a doctor from Russia. His name was uh, Leonard, uh, I have to write it down because it's Russian. It's not like I actually know that. Uh, Rosakov. And he was in an, a Russian outpost doing some studying in Antarctica. The nearest next camp was a thousand miles away. And of course, one time during a blizzard in April, no less, April 1961, he started feeling some pain in his abdomen. Then he started getting nausea, and he realized what it was being a physician himself, his appendix. Well, he, he trained a meteorologist and a driver to help him out, but he pretty much had to set up mirrors and do an appendectomy, remove his own appendix himself, because there was no help anywhere else. Now, I don't know about you, but I would never try that. Anything past removing a splinter, I've got to go to the hospital, okay? I'm just not going to be able to do that. Uh, and sometimes splinters kind of freak me out, so if you get one, don't call me. But uh, at least don't call me first. But these men were in situations where they were doing amazing things to save their own lives. Now, you think, oh, that's incredible to have that kind of knowledge or to be put in that situation where you had to do it. But a lot of times we do the same thing spiritually all the time. We try to save our own lives spiritually, and the truth is we can't because we only have one Savior. We can make our lives better. We can make changes in our lives, but to actually save our lives from eternal death, we cannot do it. We only have one Savior. So read along with me as we look at Luke's account of Jesus. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. 
And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they were crucified, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, is, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here is that we have these three crosses. And we're actually going to do a countdown today. Three, two, one. We're all familiar with countdowns, uh, famous countdowns for shuttle liftoffs or, or anything like that, or basketball games to, to count down at the end. And I tell you, we live a countdown in our lives. And every day we have a countdown to eternity. I had a professor in college who used to say, listen, we are always one second from eternity. And he was right. We have this countdown in our lives. We're counting down to eternity at all times. But the difference is, are we counting down to eternal separation from God or eternal fellowship with God? And we're going to start right here with our first countdown is three crosses. They took Jesus and they had already arrested him. They had already tried him. And they, Pilate had come out and he said, uh, who do you want me to release every day on that celebration? He released one person. And they chose a man known as Barabbas. Happens in this very chapter just before this passage we read here. <clears throat> and Barabbas was a leader of insurrection. He was kind of a, a man who wanted to rid the people of the Roman rule. A lot of people did. It wasn't uncommon. And of course, he did like everyone else. They arrested him and said, this is treason. You'll have to die for that. And he was condemned to be crucified. But on this day, he said, maybe these people will take Jesus, but they didn't. Instead, they chose Barabbas. So Jesus took Barabbas' cross instead. Listen, the three crosses up here, none of them were Jesus's. None of them were intended for him. They were all somebody else's. And the truth is, those crosses that Jesus had, one of them was mine. And one of them was yours. You see, the thing to know about Jesus on this cross is that it's not his. It's not his sin he's being condemned for. Just as we read in Isaiah earlier, he took the guilt and iniquity of everyone else, and it was laid upon him. And that's why he's up there, to take our place. And I want you to understand, this is a substitutionary death. It's not just a rescue. You see, sometimes we think of Christ being like a fireman. He runs into the building, and there's these people that are going to die because of the flames and the smoke, and he puts them on his shoulder, and he carries them out to safety, and now we have a life, and we can be thankful for that. That's not what happened. That's not what happened with Christ. See, Christ is more like uh, two people on an airplane. The airplane loses power, and it's plunging to the earth, and there's one parachute. So instead, one person gives it to the other person and says, you go live, I will die instead. That's what Christ did. He literally took our place in death. He was the substitution for us. He stood in our place, taking what we were guilty of, taking what we were condemned to face, and he stood there instead so that we could not have to face it. That's how he first gave us life, is that he stood in our place. And of these three crosses, none of them are his. And they're mocking him, and they're, they're, they're making fun of him, and they're, they're torturing him for no reason. And by the way, this is also what we just read in Isaiah chapter 53. These things that were happening to him were all covered then. 700 years beforehand, it was prophesied. Christ knew what he was getting into when he came to earth. He didn't die by accident either, by the way. I want to make sure that that's clear to you. He died on purpose with intention. He told us earlier in this same Gospel of Luke, he said, I come to seek and to save that which was lost and to give my life as a ransom. He came on purpose to die in your place. He came on purpose to die in my place. This was not an accident. This was just not a plan of God that went wrong. From the foundations of the earth, they knew this day would come. And here it is. Three crosses. None of them are his. Verse 39. Read along with me. One of the criminals, criminals who were hanged railed against him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence and condemnation? 
And indeed, we justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. In our countdown to eternity, we have three crosses, but we also have two paths. These two lives that we see represented here. And by the way, make no mistake, Luke knows what he's writing here as well. God knows what he's having inspired in this word. You see, before this, in Matthew chapter 25, we have a lot of the parables, and we have the parable of the sheep and the goats. And Jesus says, he tells a parable of one day that he will, that will, people will gather before him like a shepherd gathering his flock. And he will separate them out, the sheep on one side and the goats on the other. And here is Jesus now put in the middle of these two criminals. One because they wanted to probably make him look like he was the ring leader, like Barabbas would have been. They wanted to make him look like he is a criminal just like them, like Barabbas would have been, and like you and I would be. But instead, he's got them separated on his left and on his right. And we see this parallel with this same passage that Jesus told us earlier, what's going to happen in the end times when God gathers everyone for Judgment Day. And Jesus is giving us another sample of it right here. On my left and on my right, two paths that people can choose. And there are two different lives that these paths represent. First criminal, who was hanged, railed against him, the scripture says here. Now some of your Bibles may say hurled insults or anything like that. A lot of different things, yelled at him and things. The word there that we get is, is blasphemino. Uh, it's from the Greek word, it means blaspheme. He was blaspheming. And if you blaspheme something, you take something that's holy and you make it unholy. You try to reduce its value. And just the same insults that he was getting earlier and all the blasphemy from all the leaders, from the soldiers, from all the people standing there, is this man just joined in. And he here is hanging beside of him. By the way, we, we talk about Jesus being crucified. He was not the only one who was crucified. Again, all three of these men are being crucified. All three of these men are nailed to the cross. All three of these men have nail scars in their wrists and in their feet, but the difference is only Jesus died in our place. Those men were dying in their own places. And here's this man, guilty of his own sin, guilty of hanging there, and what is he saying? Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Basically, he's saying, hey, hey, I hear all these things about you. They say you're the Messiah, the, the Son of God, that you can get us out of this. Get us out of it. You see, his own focus is himself. He wants to get out of this situation. He wants to be rescued out of this so he can do what? Probably continue on in his own life. And that's what we do if we're not careful. We're going to take our lives that God offers us and we're going to say, great, now can I have it? Don't forget Scripture tells us that He is our Savior and Lord. One of the paths that we choose is the path where we are in charge of everything. The path where we're God. And that happened all the way back in the Old Testament in Genesis. That's the first thing that Satan did when he came to the garden and he saw Adam and Eve. And he said, God doesn't want you to eat this fruit because he knows you will be like him. And we've been trying to be like him ever since. Where we are in control, where we are in charge, where I'm the one who makes all the decisions. And here is this man who is now caught up in the consequences of his decisions. And by the way, let me just say this. He's not here by mistake. A lot of times I hear people saying that, uh, well, uh, he just made a bad mistake. Let me tell you the difference between mistakes and decisions. A mistake is an, an unintentional action that can yield an unintentional result. A decision is an intentional action that can yield an unintentional result. Okay, let me give you a good example. Knew a young lady years ago uh, in our youth group, and she was dating one of the guys in our youth group. A friend of mine knew everyone. And one day we're on a youth trip, and we're walking around. We're on a hiking trail, and the trail guide is giving us, stopping us different points, giving us things to look at and some information about things we're doing. And one of the times we stopped, I noticed this young lady. She was a high school student. She put her arm around the arm of her boyfriend's brother. I saw it. I didn't think anything. They're brothers. There's a great family. Uh, they're very close. But then I noticed her brother was standing like this with his brother's girlfriend's arm there, and he's looking around, awfully awkward-like. And I realized, what's going on? 
So then I noticed the young lady do this. Oh, and she hooks arms with the other guy. She hooked the wrong arm. She had every intention to hook arms with her boyfriend and got the wrong arm. That was a mistake. Her intention was to hook arms with her boyfriend, but she mistakenly got the wrong arm. Now, a few years later, a friend of mine, a mutual friend, is talking about this same young lady. He sketched me up and said, did you hear she got married? I said, no, I didn't hear that. Oh, well, that's good. He goes, well, she kind of had to. I said, really? He said, yeah, she got pregnant out of wedlock, so she had to. That was a decision, and that was the consequences of a decision. It was not a mistake. It was a decision she made in her life, and those were the consequences that came with it. This man is not on this cross by mistake. He's there by his decisions, and these are consequences. Our lives have fewer mistakes than we would like to admit and a lot more bad decisions than we care to confess. But the difference is, are we going to continue on that way, or are we going to start looking at ourselves differently? This man says, save us. But the other man says this. He rebuked him. And by the way, when you rebuke somebody, you, you try to set them straight. You try to bring them to a point of truth. You try to, to correct them. So he's rebuking him, saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, don't you know we're going to die? Don't you know we're going to stand before God in just any moment now? Don't you know our whole lives are going to be called up in account? Aren't you worried about that at all? Are you still trying to just live a life? 41. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Do you see what he viewed Christ as? He said, listen, stop talking to him. You and I are here because we messed up. You and, here, you and I are here because we got caught. You and I are here because we made bad decisions and we chose a bad life and this is the results. But he's not here because of any of that. Scripture doesn't say, but I can't help but wonder if that man hanging there didn't look at that sign that Pilate had posted above Christ that says the king of the Jews and didn't see it as mockery but saw it as truth and actually believed it. Because honestly, it was true. I think Pilate knew it, and I think this criminal knew it. But here's a man, again, bad choices in life, consequences, and now he's paying for them. But he's owning up to it. You see, these two paths that we have to follow, they either go with following Christ or rejecting Christ. You see, we can either have a life that follows after Christ so we want to become more like Him, or we can have a life that rejects Christ so we can become more of what we are, more of who we think we should be. And it's easy to tell. It's easy to know which one you're on. It's just simple. Which one do you pray more? Lord, get me out of this, or Lord, get this out of me. You see the difference in those? Because in one, I'm just trying to get out of a situation so I can get back to my life. In the other, I'm trying to become who God has called me to be and be transformed into a follower of Christ. Three crosses, two paths, but only one Savior. Read with me chapter 23, verse 42. And he said, talking about the criminal, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So here's a man. He has done wrong. He has done gravely wrong things according to society. And he is dying because of those things. He has confessed it. And now he is pleading just for mercy. But who is he pleading for mercy from? Not from all the people but from God himself. We have a great picture here of what it means to become saved. People say, well, how do I get saved? Well, you don't have any better example of that than this man right here. First things first, I'm up here because of what I've done. 
I know I am a sinner. I know that Christ died not in his place because of what he did. He died in my place because of what I did. He said, I'm here justly. But Lord, you didn't deserve any of this. And then he asked this. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. First off, again, remember, he saw the sign above the head, king of the Jews. Lord, you're obviously the son of God. Lord, obviously you're going to have a kingdom that you come into. Obviously you have a kingdom that you're going to rule. Will you remember me? And this phrase, remember me, literally means to be mindful of me. Will you please keep me in mind? In other words, it's a request for some kind of uh, mercy, some kind of reward even. You see, we had this happen back in Genesis. A man named Joseph was in prison. And he was gifted of God. He couldn't inter interpret genes. And he had a couple of guys in there who worked closely with the Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt at that time. And they said, well, we have dreams and, and they're disturbing us. And he said, well, let me tell you your dreams. I'll interpret if you tell me what they are. And one man, unfortunately, he said, I, I have bad news. That means you're going to die. But the other man, he said, listen, it means you're going to be restored back to Pharaoh. <clears throat> you're going to be the cupbearer for Pharaoh again, and you will stand right by his side. And Joseph has this request. Could you remember me when you were standing by Pharaoh again? And he did remember him two years later. Two years later, G Joseph is still in prison. And one day Pharaoh says, I had a dream last night and oh, it's just, I'm just so upset by it and I don't know what it means. <clears throat> so he calls all his, his, his uh, leaders in and all his wise men and they say, well, tell us your dream. We'll tell you what it means. He said, listen, if you're really wise man, you will tell me what my dream is. And he said, can nobody interpret this dream? And finally the cupbearer says, oh, you know, I remember a guy when I was at summer camp in your prison a couple of years ago. He could probably help you. Here's this man who says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus tell him? Truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Listen, believer, the moment that you ask Christ to be the Lord of your life and to forgive you for your sins, he did. Immediately. Today. Non-believer, the moment that you ask God to forgive you for your sins, that you ask him to wipe the slate clean, when you ask him to, to be the Lord of your life, he does it right then. Now, does that mean you know everything about following God and that you become all wise all of a sudden? No, no. But that means immediately you are a child of God. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, interesting word there because he doesn't really use it anywhere else. We talk about heaven and we talk about the, the throne and we talk about the pearly gates and things like that. But Jesus says in paradise. This was actually a word that they would have used to refer to a place of paradise, even specifically, maybe even the Garden of Eden. And Jesus is telling him, listen, I see what you're doing here. You're hanging on a cross. You're living out the consequences of your life. But I've got a promise for you that today you're going to be with me and we will be returned to the Garden of Eden, walking with God like it was always supposed to be. You have a countdown to eternity. Three, two, one. And then what? And I will tell you this, I have been in a few hospital rooms, some of family, some of friends, and I've seen those countdowns come. I have watched the breaths get slower and slower and further and further apart. I have watched, even on my watch, counting the number of seconds in between the breaths until finally no more breaths come. I have literally been there to see loved ones face three, two, one, and that's all. Jesus faced the same death. He died in our place for our sin. But here's the thing to know. Why he is our only savior. In chapter 24, right after this, Verse 1, 
But on the first day of the week, Sunday, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Verse 6. If you don't have this marked in your Bible, you should mark this sometime. Verse 6. He is not here, but has risen. Remember he told you while he was still in Galilee? Remember what Jesus taught you guys when he was walking with you? He said this day would come and it's here. He's not dead. He's risen. Yes, he died. Yes, he was on that cross. Yes, he was in the grave, but he's gone now. Christ died in order to save us from our sins, but he rose again to remind us of two things. One, that he truly is the Son of God and he truly is the only Savior. But two, also to remind us that we're going to face the same day when we are called up out of our graves or we're just called up off the face of the earth and we will stand before God. Folks, we are going to be resurrected to an eternal life, but the difference is, is it going to be eternal life in the judgment of God, separated from Him, or in the fellowship of God, walking with Him? And if you don't walk with God now, why in the world would you expect to walk with God then? The fellowship you have now is what is carried on to the fellowship you have then. If you are the, the thief on the cross who is on Christ's left, so to speak, if you are that man who is still trying to get your own life, you will constantly be trying to get your own life and you will never be free for an eternity. But if you are the man who recognizes what you have done has put you there, that Christ is your only Savior, you will be free for an eternity. Yes, you will still have consequences on this world. That criminal never got off the cross. He didn't get down off there. He wasn't raised from the grave three days later. He didn't get to go to a church. He didn't get to go turn his life around and make amends for anything. But Christ did it for him, and he understood that. And because of that, he was given fellowship with God for eternity. Listen, the evangelist Angel Martinez used to say, Folks, Christ died for the sins of the whole world, John 3.16. So really, it's not your sin that's going to send you to hell. It's your rejection of God that will. Because those sins have already been paid for. And what you do is when you continue to live your life like this one criminal who says, just get me out of this so I can keep on living, is you're rejecting God. That's what's separating you. That's what's holding your life back. That is what's going to determine your eternity when your countdown comes. Three, two, one. And folks, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, it is the destiny of every man, and that means every man, woman, and child, to die once and to face the judgment. And just like that parable in chapter 25, will he say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Yes, this criminal heard that very thing. <laughs> Wait, Jason, he didn't do anything. He was a criminal hanging on the cross. He didn't get to go on a mission trip. He didn't get to go raise money for Easter offering. He didn't get to go and teach Sunday school. No, he didn't. But he believed. And he trusted Christ. Well done, my good and faithful servant. The other option is that you live a life of rejection. And you hear, depart from me, sinner. I never knew you. You never wanted to know me. Therefore, you never will. Folks, today is the day to choose. Today is a day of rejoicing. No matter what your life is going through, no matter what you're handling, God says, even the grave itself will not separate you from me. I have conquered death. I've conquered the grave. I've conquered eternity. Will you follow me? Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you died in our place at the cross of Calvary to give us true eternal life. You did not die because of what you had done. You died because of what I did and because of what those listening did. Father, I pray for those who are still trying to find life. Father, those who are just praying that you will get them out of this. Father, I pray that they understand that you died to get that out of them, to get the sin from their life, that they could truly be the people of God and be followers of you. Thank you again for your love and your grace. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen.
Folks, listen, if you have any comments, you have prayer requests or anything like that, feel free to email us, frostbaptist at gmail.com. Go on our website. There's also a contact there, uh, frostbaptist.com. Or you can just leave comments here, or you can call me up if you want to or anything like that. I'd love to talk with you, pray with you more, or anything else you need. Thank you. Right, we're going to close with Because He Lives. Sing with us. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. Yeah.